please take your seats now. The forum will begin in a few minutes. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. My name is Trey Grace, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and I want to welcome everybody here this evening uh, to our discussion, Partisanship and Gridlock in Congress, Can We Make Democracy Work? Uh, but before we begin the panel discussion tonight, uh, the Kennedy School today suffered a loss. One of our long-term employees and good friends, uh, Jane Latcham, who's been with the executive education programs here for many, many years, uh, tragically passed away today. Uh, and if possible, I'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence in Jane's memory. And think of her family and friends, if you would. Okay, thank you for that. It's been a, it's been a tough day for her especially for her coworkers. Um, tonight, we're really pleased to have Drew Faust, the 28th president of Harvard University, uh, the Lincoln Professor of History at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, to give an introduction and welcome us uh, to the forum tonight and to frame the discussion before handing it over to our moderator and our panelists. So please join me in welcoming President Faust. <laughs> Thank you, Trey, and thank you to our panelists in advance. I thought it was so important to try to ask and answer the questions that these panelists are going to address with us tonight, because I think we all are searching for answers. In the first 16 days of last month, as I know you all remember, with Congress having failed to pass a new budget or extend the one in place, the federal government shut down. Government services, national parks, programs around the country ground to a halt. More than 750,000 federal employees were furloughed and 1.3 million workers were required to report to work, but with no guarantee of whether and when they'd get paid. Around the world, people looked at us and scratched their heads and began to wonder about the United States. Is the American experiment unraveling? Is the US dollar a reliable global currency? One columnist pondered whether or not the United States had become a failed state. Here at home, people got angry. They needed to know they could rely on air traffic controllers, nursing home reimbursements, highway repairs, border control posts. They needed their government to work. Now that seems to me a pretty reasonable request, a working government. Yet despite the agreement that led to a reopening of the government, deep divisions in our politics and in our ability to work together for the common good remain. Deep divisions are not new to our government. Washington Post columnist and Harvard alum E.J. Dion describes the United States as conceived in argument. Mm -hmm. But for nearly two and a half centuries, we've most of the time, I'm a Civil War historian, so I know when we haven't figured out how to govern while arguing, but most of the time we figured out how to compromise, how to find common ground. You think of these pairings that have become legendary, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, Ted Kennedy and Orrin Hatch, Russ Feingold and John McCain. These people all knew that reaching across the aisle, giving some, getting some, winning some, losing some, was essential and was the way things actually got done. For most of our history, policymaking has been understood to be a process that requires compromise, that requires the accommodations of other points of view. Compromise has often been seen as a virtue, not as a sign of weakness. What has changed? Our panel tonight is going to help us to understand whether things have changed, whether they've changed for good, whether they can change back, and what we all can do about it. And I look forward to this very much. 
I also am especially delighted to be able to introduce our moderator for tonight's panel. There is no better person uh, to serve us in this role than my friend Karen Gordon Mills. She is an IOP fellow at the moment and we are delighted to have her here at Harvard. And she has engaged citizens in the work of getting things done, creating opportunities for success in a variety of roles. Most recently, she has been the administrator of the U.S. Small Business Administration, where more than 193,000 businesses received help under her uh, administration, uh, help amounting to more than $100 billion, a figure that is matched only by her ability and commitment to enabling individuals from wide range of backgrounds to take part in the innovation economy. She works successfully at the SBA with both Democrats and Republicans to promote small business and to encourage the growth of our economy and she knows very well how to move people and prosperity forward. I'm also proud to say that she is a graduate of Harvard College and of Harvard Business School, and that she is a former vice chair of our governing board, the uh, Board of Overseers. So let me turn this over to her able hands. Karen, thank you so much for being here and doing this. Karen, thank you. Well, thank you all for being here, and many, many thanks to President Faust for convening us. I asked her just before in the green room, um, you know, what would you like to accomplish tonight? And she said, well, it would be nice if you could solve the problem. <laughs> so, panel, we have our work cut out for us. Now, luckily, the President put together a fantastic panel to um, uh, bring us insight and perhaps solutions. And I'm going to uh, not introduce them fully um, because you've got uh, the long bio in your notes, but you might want to know just a couple things about Professor Alex Kesar, who is at the end here. Um, not only is he a historian of, of many things we're going to talk about today, but also has written on maritime history, being from the state of Maine, I appreciate that, the history of science and technology. And he is a screenwriter, so he might do a treatment for TV on what's going on in Congress to follow the already successful House of Cards, right? Um, now, we have a, a, a second um, uh, academic point of view here. Um, Professor, Professor Theda Scotchpole, known to many of you, and particularly well known to my liaisons at the Institute of Politics who have tutored me in her work. Um, <laughs> but what you don't know about the professor is that she knows, uh, is an expert on football. And I am going to ask her about my fantasy football team after this because I need a new running back. <laughs> um, Secretary Solis, uh, I had the great honor of serving with the secretary in the president's cabinet. Uh, we have um, shared many uh, a girls' dinner uh, the girls of the cabinet had dinner together uh, every month or so. And um, we also shared many initiatives. And um, she is my colleague and friend. But she is also here because she uh, spent eight years in Congress and can bring us the insight uh, for, as a, of a sitting congressperson and also somebody who is running for a, uh, an, an, an office uh, another statewide office, I guess it is, back in, or, or district office, back in um, her home uh, area of Los Angeles. And then, without his hat, or maybe with his hat, um, the famous Mark McKinnon, who uh, many of us see on TV often. But uh, Mark, you are here also in your role as the head of No Labels. And you're going to talk a little bit, I think, about that with us. But Mark is also a songwriter as many of you know, so we have a screenwriter and a songwriter. I think we're going to be just fine. So before we make, uh, make music, um, <laughs> let me begin with um, one thought, which is um, apparently back in the day, George Washington said to um, Thomas Jefferson that um, it was expected that Congress was going to be contentious. And that, uh, in fact, 
we, he said, we need to pour our legislation into the senatorial saucer to cool it because the expectation was that it would bubble and overflow and be overheated in the House and then be poured into the uh, Senate where it would become cool and things would get done. <laughs> and um, perhaps today, uh, this, this isn't happening so much. Um, Alex, maybe you might begin by giving us a historical perspective. Are we more divided today than in the past? And have there been some historical moments uh, when the parties have shut down government before or had as much contentious behavior? The answer to those questions is simply yes. There have <laughs> been moments in the past. I mean, as President Faust uh, mentioned, we did have a civil war. Um, and you can think of that as a government shutdown um, and, <laughs> um, and, and a lot else. Um, the country shutdown. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and, and three quarters of a million people died as a result of that shutdown. So, uh, yeah, and there are other moments as well. I mean, the, you know, in the early years of the Republic, uh, after the 1800 election, I mean, we think of the Founding Fathers as this group of you know, collective wise men who, you know, who, who deliberated together. And, you know, uh, some of them really hated each other by the early 19th century. And you know, we have to remember you know, in 1804, a sitting vice president shot and killed the former secretary of the treasury. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, another yeah. sign of sharp divisions, I, I, um, um, I would say. Uh, so, it, you know, the partisan acrimony of that period is notable. I think the other period that's worth our thinking about, which doesn't involve splits in Congress so much, is the 1930s, when there was something of a, of a threatened paralysis of government itself because of the Supreme Court's willingness to throw out uh, any legislation that was passed that might possibly do something to ameliorate the Great Depression. Now, what, what I just want to say at the outset, I don't want to go on too long, is that I don't think what we should take from that is simply, well, we've had these problems in the past, it'll be okay. I mean, I, the question is, what, what, can we, what can we learn from that? I and mean, one thing we learn is that those, those moments were moments when there was a whole lot at stake and there were really, really severe disagreements uh, about, about policy and, and, and disagreements that, that didn't seem to some people to be bridgeable or compromisable. Um, it would almost be a betrayal of your principles to, to, to compromise. And I think that that is something like what we are seeing today where there, I, I think the overarching issue going on right now is whether the role of the federal government in domestic policy, um, which there's been a broad consensus about for the last 80 years, that it would be to, pr to protect against excesses of private power, regulate markets within some limits, encourage equality, encourage democracy, um, and protect the least well-off members of the society. I think the question is whether that role of government, of the federal government, is going to continue, and it's perceived with great urgency. Now, the, so, the one last thing I would add as a yeah. question is um, there, there, there certainly are other factors in the political culture and other things we will talk about that somehow seem to be making it impossible to compromise over those severe substantive issues. Well, and, and that's where we'll go next um, with Professor Scotchpool here. What's going on with the Tea Party? Now, the professor has... Uh, written about the Tea Party, gone out in this country and talked to many, many, many voices, uh, been in the room with folks in the Tea Party, but 38% of Republicans consider themselves part of the Tea Party movement, and in some polls that's even higher. Um, why does this group have such tremendous appeal? What's going on? And how significant are the divisions in the Republican Party? Well, they're very significant. Um, you know, I think that we talk a lot about polarization in Congress and in the society, and there is a fair amount of disagreement about the issues that Professor Kasar identified. But uh, the, the, the pull is sharper to the right on the side of the Republican Party, and the Republican Party right now is very deeply divided at all levels, from elites to ordinary voters who tell uh, national survey researchers that they think of themselves as Republicans. My colleague Vanessa Williamson and I were puzzled about the Tea Party and we went out and observed meetings and sat down for quiet one-on-one -on -one interviews with grassroots Tea Partiers in several parts of the country. And what we heard when we talked to people one-on-one -on -one 
was middle class Americans, older white people, conservative minded to be sure, but also quite angry and fearful about the changes that they think are taking their country away from them at this moment. Partly it's something that happens any time a president uh, uh, comes to power with co-partisans in Congress, which happened in 2008, the other party reacts. But it had a harder edge to it this time because Barack Obama was seen as championing changes that appealed to younger Americans uh, that would, as he put it, uh, build an economy from the middle and bottom up rather than the top down, and which many grassroots Tea Partiers saw as threatening their hard-won uh, livelihoods and Medicare, Social Security, veterans' benefits that they felt they had earned as hard-working Americans. On top of that, you have some pretty well-resourced ideological groups that are willing to send money around to challenge Republican office holders and Republican candidates for Congress and state legislatures who dare to compromise. Compromise becomes a dirty word and evil in this portion of the Republican Party. And I want to stress that it's not all Republicans. Actually, the last shutdown that we saw, 80% of Americans were opposed to it. And if you go out and go through the country and listen to what people are saying, you hear anger from people of many partisan persuasions about that. But uh, from the point of view of the grassroots people who are good citizens, who turn out in Republican primaries and vote against compromisers with the hated Barack Obama and with Democrats, and of the roving billionaire ultra-free market ideologues who send money into Republican primaries, Compromise is something that they don't want to see, and they were prepared to go all the way to an unpopular government shutdown to prevent it. Will this end? We'll talk about that, but my short answer is it's not ending quickly because the leverage on the Republican Party does not depend on general popularity. It depends on the sense that one doesn't want to be challenged from the right, and the forces at work uh, are pretty determined. Uh, to, to tough out uh, budget battles and policy battles for the next several years. Well, Mark, I'm going to skip to you for a second. So where do we go from here? You co-founded a group, um, No Labels. It is gaining some traction, you told me. Um, can we achieve a government that works? Can we find a way uh, to bring people together to make this kind of compromise? Well, the tunnel's dark, but there is light. Uh, uh, the, about three years ago, uh, in response to what we were seeing in Washington, there's an enormous energy that you, that you all see uh, in your communities and we saw outside of Washington, uh, an anger and a frustration about the fact that whether, whether your friends and neighbors were Republicans or Democrats, and sometimes strong Democrats or strong Republicans, to a person, almost all of them said, yeah, I have, have strong political feelings and passions, but I think Washington's got to work. I mean, we've got significant policy issues that we face right now that are affecting all of us, our, our quality of life, our children's future. And so there's got to be give somewhere. And the problem, as, uh, as the professors have, have pointed out to, which we could talk about for hours, but among those problems are a system today that's different than it was a long time ago, which rewards bad behavior. In other words, because of Citizens United and the funding of these other groups, you have a system that is, is that, that it, by which they, we, somebody coined the, the term profit for purity recently, which I thought was perfect. <laughs> but you have these groups of consultants like me and my old hat who go out and make money by, 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 uh, by punishing people for good behavior. And so what we said was there's nothing out there rewarding people for good behavior. And so the idea broadly was that we would try and cast a net uh, around the country and bring some of this energy from outside of Washington to reinforce what we would describe as adult good behavior. Um, and it's been a very interesting uh, exercise. And I just, I just want to kind of briefly describe the arc because it's, it, it, I think it's, it's important to understanding where we go from here because we've learned a lot. Uh, at first, what we thought, and what I thought specifically, was there's not enough representation in the middle, uh, and that we need to 
uh, and for lots of reasons because of redistricting and things we've lost, kind of representation in the middle and the moderates, progressives, what have you. Uh, and so we thought we would sort of represent that voice that was missing, quickly discovered that that was not very productive. One, you get a thousand people in a room and asking what their idea of a centrist is, you'll get a thousand different ideas about what that is. Uh, two, we discovered that the country is polarized. It's not just Congress, but, the, but so is the country. As we become more mobile and can move around, people are living in like communities. Uh, and so the, the country itself is more polarized. And so then we said, OK, well, uh, then perhaps we need to address the systemic problems that are, are, that are creating. Again, we could talk for an hour about those things, but it's things like redistricting reforms and campaign finance reforms and electoral reforms, primary reforms, those sort of things. Interesting experiments going on around there, and there's some good news there, too. But we said other people are doing that. That's going to take a long time to happen. We want to try and achieve more uh, instant results. And so what we decided to do was to focus our attention on trying to build trust in the Congress. We said we can't just be outside Congress. We have to get Congress to buy into this. So we did a lot of work over the last three years, working with chiefs of staffs, working with members, about trying to find a way in which we could kind of, you know, I describe Washington as, currently as a place where people are shoveling sand into the engine of government, just shutting it down. And so we're trying to get in there, clean it up, find a place where we can put some oil in it, just to get the engine moving again. Not necessarily talking about a destination, but just where people can trust one another again. Because, uh, as you know, uh, it's gotten so highly polarized that many Republicans, Senator Joe Manchin was a good example. He, I talked to him a couple, he said, I've been in the Senate two years, I've never had a meeting with a Republican. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I never any kind of formal meeting. And so we said, well, that's got to change. And so what we decided to do was, uh, was first of all bring pressure from now over a half a million members that we have that represent every Senate district in the country. And then we came out with a bunch of ideas that aren't really left or right. They're not Democratic or Republican, not obviously. They're more kind of what I call process issues that don't have an ideological tinge to them. Uh, and, and then we said uh, we want members of Congress to join what we call the No Labels Problem Solvers Coalition. We announced that in January. Our goal was that we, would we had 20 people come out when we announced that we hoped that we could get to 50. Uh, the leadership on both sides kind of patted us on the head and said, that's very nice. Come back to us when you get 70. Well, I'm happy today to announce that we have 87 members of the United States Congress, half Republicans, half Democrats, who have joined this caucus, who have found it so productive and rewarding, we wanted them to meet once a month. But they're getting such great feedback from their constituents, and they're finding they're actually getting stuff done that they're meeting, meeting weekly now. They have, in the last three months, uh, developed, written, and filed 17 different pieces of legislation. And they are co-sponsoring that legislation. They're all working on that legislation. And I'll just say, uh, finally, as a note of, of, of how this can and does work in real time, one of the ideas that came out of this work that we did collectively was an idea called No Budget, No Pay, which was as simple as it sounds. The idea is that if the Congress doesn't do their job, which is to write a budget, Primarily, that's their job because that's the blueprint for their job just as it is for a business. We said, if you don't put forward a budget, and at that point, the Senate hadn't put forward a budget since the introduction of the iPad, and that was just last spring. And so uh, we said, uh, and this was an enormously popular idea, especially outside of Washington, not so popular inside Washington, but as, an, as evidence of the traction that we can get, that idea, as you may recall, became the short-term solution to the last debt ceiling crisis in the spring where that helped kind of break the floodgates. And they said, if the Senate will pass a budget, we'll extend the ceiling. And that's what happened. So the idea is that we would extend that more broadly to the entire budgeting and appropriations process. But, uh, but so I'm, I'm, it's, it's way beyond my expectations. I had really hoped to get to 50 this year. People are doing it. And, th and they are finding such a great reaction from their constituents that now, instead of trying to get to 50, the, the thing that we're talking about now is maybe we need to cap this at some point. Because at some point, maybe we have so many members that doesn't have that much meaning. But we're not going to do that. I'm happy to have as many as we can. That's 50 and out of 400 and uh, 500. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 435. Yeah. Right. So um, last question for Hilda. You were in the, uh, in the Congress. And you said to me that when you were there, it was much more collegial. And uh, now we're reminiscing about some of the times we went up to testify, which were a lot more, uh, a lot less right. collegial. Um, but what do you think uh, about Congress now versus then? And what do you think about the demographic changes that you are very much engaged in uh, and have been engaged in? How do you think that that is going to influence um, the issue, the gridlock we have today? 
Well, when I did serve in the, in the House, it was for eight years, to, between 2009, two, 2000 and 2009. And obviously, um, there were more opportunities to interact across the aisle. And I, in fact, I remember one of my first committee assignments was on education and workforce. And the chair of the committee was Mr. Boehner. And we had a very good relationship, you know, friendly, talkative. Um, we couldn't always win on every issue, but there was compromise. We could even work out language. I remember even uh, disputing an amendment that he wanted to propose to committees and uh, the subcommittee that it would, how it, be, it would be established. And I worked very hard with other members to, to see if we could over, overturn or change it and modify it, and we did. And it came out to everyone's benefit, including his party. So, I mean, at that time, there was that kind of compromise. Um, it's since changed. I don't think there's a lot of time being spent uh, with members across the aisle like we used to. We used to have, even in our own delegation in California, one of the largest delegations, where you'd have Republicans and Democrats get together. That doesn't happen anymore that I know of. Um, and I know that when I came to the cabinet, it was as though friends that I had in the House on both sides, um, m more so on the other side of the aisle, um, would treat me very differently. Or in front of people, they would treat me very differently. Uh, behind closed doors, hi, Hilda, how are you doing? But then in committee, uh, if it was an oversight committee in particular, boy, the spears came out uh, and the daggers. And it was very, very unsettling. But I you know, try to control myself and try to conduct myself in a respectful manner and to be respectful to to the members, because yeah. that's really what it's about. Well, you know, we see this quite a bit. And um, maybe it's just the media's fault. And I want you to all jump in on this. I mean, maybe it's just, you know, that the media can't seem to, um, uh, you know, be unbiased. Maybe it's because we're all watching too much cable TV. And uh, I've had folks um, talk about new media and that new media sort of should be democratizing the discussion and letting more voices in. But instead, um, people have uh, commented that the new media Twitter takes away the fact base and um, doesn't allow a conversation, in a conversation, um, a, a reader to know, is this really factual? And so that the media has become part of the problem, not uh, as much part of the solution. So I want you to jump in on this as you please. Well, I'll take a quick shot at it first. There's a lot of components to this that I think are relevant. Um, we, I'm often asked, and I see discussions about, you know, is the media biased left or right? And uh, that's an interesting conversation, but I don't think it's particularly relevant in, in the sense that it's anything we're going to do much about or that it's even problematic. What is more problematic is that there is a inherent bias toward uh, toward, uh, toward friction and, uh, uh, and train wrecks. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, they, the, the, the media generally is not going to go out and write a, everybody's getting along together. Isn't that a great story? They love food fights. And just as an anecdote, I want to, because I think this perfectly illustrates how difficult it is, I was doing a television show that's with a, you know, a show that I'm sure you've all seen with a well-known host. And we were talking about bipartisanship and some solutions and no labels, and that sort of thing. This is exactly what we're talking about. We went to the break, and when it went to break, he turned to me and said, can we just cut the bipartisan crap and throw us some red meat? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of environment we're dealing with. Yeah, nobody wants the, uh, the positive story. Other thoughts? You know, the media has changed. Uh, but let's put, keep this in a little bit of perspective. In 19th century America, the media was frankly partisan. What's different now is that it's frankly partisan in a um, uneven way, uh, in the sense that the people who spend a lot of time watching television and who, according to the best research, tend to get their ideas about what's going on uh, uh, on the conservative side of the spectrum, have self-reinforcing media. Everybody else is kind of scattered around and actually not paying much attention to political news. As recently as the 1960s, uh, the TV was on at dinner time, and there were three versions of exactly the same thing. I remember that. There was CBS, ABC, and NBC. And NBC was a tweak more liberal. 
than the, than the other two. But now uh, you can either watch interpretive news and, and shouting that reinforces what you already feel, and I think feel is a good word for it, or you can ignore it altogether, which more and more Americans are doing. They're just dropping out and turning it off. And I will agree with Mark McKenna on one thing. I think that the media in general rewards obstreperous behavior. That's why Ted Cruz won in the last episode. The country as a whole is turned off, angry. That's pretty much bipartisan because close to a majority of Republicans are also upset about what happened in October. But Ted Cruz is delighted. And why shouldn't he be? He now has perfect name recognition on the Tea Party right of the Republican Party, which is crucial in the upcoming presidential primaries, and he has 90% approval among those folks. So it, it's rewarding for certain kinds of actors to do the kind of, he, he was the general who remarkably reached across and even got House members. Uh, that's almost unheard of for House members and Senate members to cooperate, isn't it? Um, he directed them more than John Boehner was able to direct them in this recent episode. And he's come out a winner. He's the winner. Um, so let's look at the economic side of this. How much, maybe nobody's paying attention, but maybe they shouldn't pay attention because how much is this really damaging the country? Mm. And so uh, I'll be a, a little provocative and say, you know, if you look at the GDP numbers, they were better than expected, 2.8. If you look at the jobs numbers, better than expected, over 200,000. In the past two quarters were um, revised upward. Um, if you look at the stock market, up, up, up. Mm, so what is happening? Um, you know, is this really affecting our economy? Now, you could argue perhaps um, confidence is down. Uh, the fear of uncertainty, certainly in the small business um, optimism, it's down and it's being affected. And our international image is being affected. So does this matter, is it? I think, I think the real answer to that is we don't know yet. It's, too, it's, really, it's really too soon. I mean, and, I, and I think that it's a mistake to try to look at short-term indicators, uh, to think about wh what kind of impact it, it's going to have. I mean, and, and you know, I think that um, what, what we have are what we have in, 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 the, in the gridlock we're seeing is a reluctance to confront problems, uh, a real reluctance to confront problems, and that can pose some real trouble down the road. Even if the indicators right now, I mean, so the job numbers are sort of okay, although there's an awful lot of people who've been unemployed for an awful long time and we're not getting unemployment insurance benefits yeah. anymore, so I'm not sure how okay yeah. that is. Yeah, but is can I country. throw something out? Um, even though uh, people are maybe tuning out a bit, and I somewhat agree with that, I, I do know that, um, for example, on immigration reform, that there are a whole host of people, Republicans, business folks, that really want to see something happen. They even have the number of votes there, but leadership, won't it allow it, or the top tier that are run by, say, some of the Tea Party folks don't want to see it. And that would benefit our economy, put people to work, people would be paying taxes. A whole slew of things could happen. We could lower the deficit. But rational minds are not being rational, or those voices aren't being heard. And I get, I get frustrated, too, because many times I hear it from, from regular people that they want to see things done. They know what the solutions are. They know that Congress can do it, but we've got to somehow um, get their attention. So how are we going to get their attention? I mean, who is going to lead right now? Is there anybody who could be stepping up? Well, uh, let me tag on to the last question and bounce yep. to that one. The, I, I think those indicators that you mentioned are, are, I mean, they're encouraging, but I think they're incredibly illusory. Uh, I, think, I think they're underlying dynamics that are very troubling. And I hear that not just from Republicans, but from very thoughtful Democratic economists uh, who know a whole lot more about any of this than I do, but to a person, none of them are optimistic about the economic future. And I think if you quantified, uh, and some people have, the, the actual uh, the, uh, impact of the recent shutdown uh, and, and a number of other things like the sequester, it's billions and billions and billions of dollars and points on, on our economic growth, yeah, et cetera. We could be having fuller employment. 
Yeah, and so uh, I, I, one of the encouraging things to me that's, that's, I guess, bad news, good news out of all of this, from, and, and as I look through the lens of what needs to happen in the Republican Party, uh, first of all, there's, there are things that are happening that are encouraging. One is that they are starting to, to punish these uh, profit for purity companies and, and entities and take away business from them. And, and blackball them from, from working in the party. Um, uh, Ted Cruz has actually come out and said that he's not going to work against incumbents now, so the, the pressure is worked on that. But, but more to the point, and I think more importantly, the business community is sending a lot of signals of saying we've had it. Mm -hmm. With, and, and, and by the way, the most encouraging thing that came out of the last election, again for me looking at where the Republican Party needs to go, which was an encouraging sign, is uh, well, A, there was the election of Chris Christie and the loss of Ken Cuccinelli. Uh, well, that was the big story. The, the one that was not as reported, but much more important from my perspective, again, is a, was a house race in Alabama. Yeah, exactly. And that was a race that pitted a, a Tea Party darling, really a, you know, a terrific looking sort of perfect Tea Party candidate on paper, versus uh, a candidate of the Chamber of Commerce and the business interest said, we've had it, enough of this, and they put up their own candidate and beat them, and so and, and you know in, in Alabama. So mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a shift going on that's important. Wasn't one of them an incumbent? They I, both supported the government shutdown. So I mean, before we go overboard, <laughs> <laughs> baby was, steps, baby when steps. Was slightly right. more radical, though, <laughs> right? I mean, it's astonishing that two thirds, close to two thirds of the House Republicans Vote for voted shutdown. against lifting the shutdown in the face of 80% public disapproval and 16 days of, of nothing. Let me just say something about uh, whether it matters. Uh, I, I want to take uh, Secretary Hildes' example of immigration reform. This is a, an area where there are big problems that, that face the economy and the business community, and there are human problems, including young people who uh, grew up in this country and uh, deserve to be, to continue to think of themselves as full Americans after they finish uh, K through 12 school. Mm -hmm. um, there is overwhelming public support for the kind of grand bargain that in fact Democrats and Republicans came together in the Senate to support. That was pretty remarkable what happened last mm -hmm. summer. John Boehner will not bring it to a vote or anything else piecemeal that might go to a conference committee where a compromise could be worked out. Now, I don't think John Boehner is anything but a good old boy, Chamber of Commerce, let's make a deal Republican. But his behavior has changed. That tells us that this is not a problem that can be solved just by getting people in the room to be nice to each other, even though I'm for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's something larger going on here, and John Boehner, even with the business community pushing him, will not allow movement at all toward a solution of this problem that this country has been struggling with for more than a decade. And the harm will be both human and economic, and the other kind of harm that comes when our country cannot address pressing problems like full employment, uh, uh, improvement in our way of funding higher education, I, I could just go down the whole list, is that the population becomes to think that our government and our democracy can't work. And that's a terrible cost, no matter what the unemployment trend is. Right. Because it turns off people, particularly young people. So a couple of quick questions. Is there any leadership, anybody who you believe could step up, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, someone else, and make a difference in this discussion. Let's start with John Boehner. Let's ask him to step up right, right. now. Right, and we maybe could, somebody needs to have his back. We could send a message and say we would like to see that. Well, the, uh, the challenge is that, uh, is, is particularly for the Republicans or any party when they're out of power, is that you have a power vacuum. You don't have an established leader uh, of the party, and that allows other voices, Ted Cruz and others, to fill those pockets and vacuums. And it's going to, it's, it's going to, we won't have that voice until we have a Republican nominee. 
and there's going to be a big struggle between now and then. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, listen, I, I think Michael Bloomberg would be a, a great candidate for President of the United States. I wish he'd do it. I wish he'd do it as a Republican. I wish he'd do it as an independent. I wish he'd do it as a unicorn. I don't care what it is. <laughs> I wish he'd just run. But, uh, but you, 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 uh, there's no chance. Again, I, I think Chris Christie no is, uh, is the kind of person. I mean, Jeb Bush would be terrific. Yeah. I mean, there, there are lo potentially lots of good candidates out there that could provide that voice. I think. Uh, any other thoughts about the 2016 election? You know, uh, Mitt Romney <laughs> uh, was no Tea Partier. But by the time he finished going through the gauntlet of the primary process, he had endorsed every single extreme position. Uh, so you think it's going to, anybody who comes up for the Republican Party is going to need to follow that? Until path. moderate Republicans step up and organize and push back, that's what's going to happen. And I think the business community, because to the point of funding these candidates, and they've been known for doing that for years and years, they have, they have a voice. They can exert that power. And I saw what happened in Alabama. I see it happening in California right now, where there are some members of the Republican Party who are now turning and softening their blows and watching what they're saying about immigration, about a whole slew of issues that typically they didn't have to. They were pretty, pretty well set. And now changing demographics and other characteristics are, are coming into play as well. And they're threatened. So. Um, we are fire. going to turn it over to questions uh, shortly, but uh, before I do that, I have the lightning round. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to ask one question and uh, give us a quick answer as people gather their thoughts for the question and answer. I am now the fairy godmother, and I will grant you each one thing that Congress will pass tomorrow. They will pass one bill, whatever it is that you want, that you think could significantly improve this and deliver uh, what President Faust asked us to, the solution to this problem. So what would you ask, Alex, what would you ask Congress uh, to pass? I'm going to try to give a realistic rather than the uh, you, I'm make, the fairy guy. I grant you grant well, no, I, got to, um, I would like them to mandate nonpartisan districting throughout the country. No. So it's the redistricting question. Yeah. yeah, the Supreme Court would overrule that. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that, but. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Scott. OK. Well, I don't think the problem can be solved in Congress, so I have to say that. But if, if I would like to see Congress act, I would like to see the House pass immigration reform and the Senate pass filibuster reform. Those two things Those would make a, a big difference uh, in the short run. I think I would like, I would also like to bifurcate mine. So immigration reform, because we do have a Republican buy-in, and also uh, more funding for open space, natural, you know, National Park Service and, and climate change activities. We need to see more of that happening. That affects Republican districts. Look what happened in uh, Sandy, Hurricane Sandy. And people just need to be thinking about how can we find solutions to these issues that are going way beyond our control, but we can somehow address them and plan. So something that people could come together on, yes. and it would be an example of how to get things done. Well, I, I like the uh, I, I like the uh, redistricting reform. Of course, in California, is do, doing a good experiment on that. I also completely agree on filibuster reform, which is something that we've been advocating. And there's another idea that we've advocated that's along the line of filibuster reform. That's an interesting one, I think, which is which I forget what we're calling it, but it's it's basically uh, what we what you call fast track authority. You give fast track authority to the president. Uh, every every cycle for three issues. In other words, they the president would decide, president elect would decide three issues that are his or her priority, and they would get fast track authority, which basically just means all they need is a majority in the House or the Senate to pass it. They don't have to deal with the filibusters and what have you, so that whoever's elected, sort of elections have consequences. If you run on those issues, you get to have an up or down vote on those. It could be immigration reform, whatever it is. Say up or down. Uh, and I think that would be a progressive. That's a, that's a very interesting idea. So now we turn to you. And um, if you have any uh, ideas for the lightning round, please you know, <laughs> feel free to step up as well. The guidelines for the questions. Please identify yourself and your affiliation. One brief question, please. No speeches. And my <laughs> panel set the example on this. Thank you. It was great. Uh, end your question with a question mark. 
So we will begin in the balcony. Hi, thank you for being here. My name is Sylvia. I'm a junior at the college. And all of you mentioned how extreme things are right now. In, even in Facebook, it seems that social media gives voices to the extremes, not necessarily to the middle, and how m people who aren't on the extremes really need to mobilize. But what exactly can we do? We don't have a social media platform. We're not really being listened to by our congressmen and senators. So what, how exactly do we mobilize and say that enough is enough? Because this has been going on for quite a while, and it seems like us saying it's enough isn't enough. I, I gather when you say us, you mean your generation, right? Mm -hmm. are, are you speaking People who are fed up, mostly, who yeah. aren't on the extremes, which... Well, I, I would say a couple of things. They, they are, and I believe we're reaching a tipping point, and, that, and, and I think No Labels is a great example of people uh, re responding in a way that is very activist, and they're not just... You know, 10 years ago, they may have just said, I'll, I'm just going to tune it out. Now they think the issues are too important, and they're engaging. And we're seeing all kinds of evidence of that. I, I would just also add, uh, in another note, I'm an I'm a eternal optimist, but having spent as much time as I c could at Harvard, because I'm a, a serial fellow, uh, <laughs> uh, I spent a How lot many of fellows have you been here? Three for, times. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> uh, wow. So uh, I spent a lot of time around students. and. And I'm really encouraged by millennials and because I think that you are, as a group, passionate yet skeptical about what works and what doesn't and are smart about ways that you are engaging. And this goes to a whole other issue that really underline, underlies everything we're talking about, which is the broader issue of trust. The bigger problems on the economy with the government, all these issues relate to a evaporating trust that voters have in government, in the economy, in each other, I mean, that, that's why a lot of what we're trying to do in our labels is just getting people in a room and getting them to trust one another again. But uh, the way that millennials are manifesting that is they are, I, again, I think because they see the traditional channels haven't worked. So they're not necessarily just going to work on, uh, like at the Democratic National Party or the Republican Campaign Committee. They're very entrepreneurial, looking at NGOs, going to places like you No know, Labels or others that aren't the usual channels to try and promote change. So it's, they're, they're going to NGOs and nonprofits and very entrepreneurial. So uh, that's a kind of a, a shift that I see that's encouraging that's going to make the system adapt to them rather than the other way around. You, you know, good. one good example of that was the uh, DREAM Act students. They kind of organically organized across the country through social media, but also just through their old informal networks. And they caught the attention of some folks that really needed to to have their attention drawn to, to the issue. So I think there's different ways, and it goes to CBOs, grassroots organizing, and just collectively looking at non-traditional ways of reaching people. Well, you know, I'm not going to pass, because uh, uh, non-traditional ways of organizing are fine, and organizing is very important. But I'll tell you, the right to vote in this country is under attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, that may sound old-fashioned, but actually it isn't. Uh, if you look at what's happening uh, in many states across the country, all kinds of obstacles are being put in the way of many groups uh, registering to vote and exercising the right to vote. And it is very important, this is something that I don't think Occupy Wall Street was, was aware enough of, but the Tea Party activists are. The Tea Party activists are good citizens. You have to organize, you have to speak up, but you also have to vote. And, uh, um, and these, at this point, going to have to fight for the right to vote of all Americans in the way that people did when I was young as well, because the right to vote, and Professor Kasar has written about this, is not permanently won. It can be rolled back, and we're in a period of big rollback. Could, can I unpass? <laughs> um, just to, to, I mean, on this specifically, for example, um, there is now a movement that, um, you know, that a couple of members of Congress have introduced um, an amendment to, to the Constitution to guarantee a federal right to vote. That's something you can organize around. I think, right. I, I think that one of the things that, that, that you and your friends can do is think about what, what the obstacles are. Think about what it is that's leaving you feeling powerless. And think of, pick one dimension of that that you think maybe you can change if you mobilize. Well, and where you could reach out to people of other other groups. And I, 
I think, you know, that the right to vote is much more worth fighting to extend and guarantee than, for example, a quixotic quest to get money out of politics, which will not happen in the lives of my grandchildren even. <laughs> uh, it's not going to happen. Hi, my name is Carolyn. I'm a junior here at the college. Thank you so much for speaking here tonight. I'm asking this question on behalf of the forum committee. So as was mentioned tonight, parties are fighting not only each other, but also amongst themselves. There are certain factions that want to encourage bipartisanship, that want to encourage compromise. And there are other citizens who want the representatives to stick to their principles and not compromise. What can party leaders do to attempt to heal these divisions within their own parties? Or is this a change that simply has to come from the bottom up? Is there nothing leadership can do about this? Leadership can do something. And I know that even in my caucus, the Democratic caucus, when I was a member, we had divisions. We had what we call blue dogs. You had centrists, and then you had the progressives. I was part of the progressives. And so every now and then, you know, we'd all have to get in the room with the leader, and we'd have an adult talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is this issue that. about the adults in the room and uh, this question about leadership. And, you know, we've had other leaders in the past, um, you know, George Mitchell and, you know, Tip O'Neill and others who have, uh, Newt Gingrich, you know, who um, provide a certain level of, uh, you know, gravitas to this, these discussions. Is there somebody who could rise up? Uh, you know, I don't think it's true that Democrats are not willing to compromise. I mean, the opinion polls show that Democrats and independents and non-Tea Party Republicans all believe in compromise. And um, political scientists actually have quantitative measures for these things. And uh, there's a broader tent right now in the Democratic Party, and members of that fairly broad tent uh, actually work things out, uh, and are re are are willing often to to engage in compromise, and have, I think, quite often in the last few years made pre made uh, the first uh, move. And we had some idea about re rewarding good behavior. Well, right? I, I push back on that just a little bit okay. because I think that there are there. Yeah. Maybe not the exact same numbers, but the same sort of moneyed interests are applying the same sort of pressures on the left, and the pressures are not to compromise on entitlement reforms and all kinds of things on the left, where you have lots of progressives that are locking in on no compromise on Social Security entitlement, no compromise. So it's not just dedicated to one side or the other. To your question, I would say that um, it's just remarkable. It sounds so simple. Uh, the impact that just knowing people and being in the same room with them has. And, and it's, it would, it just, I mean, it's, it's shocking to discover the extent to which members actually don't meet with members of the other party. They used to do it. Mm -hmm. And there used to be, uh, and, and uh, Secretary, you know what some of those were, but there were sort of system, systematized, routinized mm -hmm. meetings of caucuses, of you had lunches, you had. The Women's Caucus. Okay, yes. that's a good example. Right. I was and a maybe party. now well, with women, all the women are in the more Senate. willing to compromise, and there is quantitative data that shows that. But um, there's also uh, new research that shows that moderate Republican women are having trouble uh, making their way to office. They are not as often nominated, and they are not as often elected. So more women actually is something that will help. Well, but there have to be Faust, women on both sides the of the aisle. <laughs> more women. We've, clear, we've found the answer that's here. A, are you, were you unanimous <laughs> yeah, As you saw, the women played a very important role in bringing this last compromise. Uh, and I hope somebody will ask the question, where are we heading now? Dan. Thanks, Karen. Uh, I'm Dan Cunningham. I'm an advanced leadership fellow here at uh, Harvard University this year. And my question is for... And a small business owner. And I am a small business owner uh, from the Midwest. And my question is for uh, Professor uh, Stackpole and also uh, Secretary Solis. And, um, and, and I happen to know John Boehner. I'll see him from time to time. And if he was, he's just a regular guy. I agree yeah, with you. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but Midwest the question <laughs> is, um, well, uh, the data is very clear since the 1970s, wages for the average American have not gone up at all by inflation. It's been very flat. And I, I haven't heard anybody talk about that economic fact in terms of driving this behavior in Congress. 
I'm interested in your viewpoint on that. And then uh, if there was, a, and just to take that metric of increasing the wages for the average American, because uh, it hasn't happened in a long time, is that something John Boehner you think would warm up to, both the professor and the secretary? Thank you. Well, he's been offered opportunities to warm up to it, and he's um, very carefully prevented them from coming to votes or voted against them. I mean, you know, uh, I do think that the stagnation of family wages for the last four decades for the bottom 80% of the population is part of the sense of anxiety and anger uh, out there. But it isn't what drove the grassroots Tea Party. That um, there's good, you'd have to read my book to understand we explored that. And I don't think the problems are just economic, although the inability of the government to function, even on things that most people could work out, um, has economic consequences. It hasn't helped us to adapt our economy to the new era and, and promote better wages and opportunities for most Americans, that's for sure. Well, I'm really concerned that the middle class is, is diminishing and that we really do need to take a hard look at that. But at the same time, I know that right now in the Congress, we're not going to see a minimum wage bill come up that the president and others are advocating for. And it's going to have to happen at the local level. And a lot of local jurisdictions can do that. So can state government. You can even put initiatives on, on the ballot and get them passed that way. That's another alternative. And that's kind of what's happened in California, by the way. Um, but I would also say that it's really, I think, important for people to understand that there's, there's got to be other points of view heard. And I know that there are some reasonable business people, Republicans, who really do want to see some change and would like to see um, all of us prosper. A good idea that you know President Obama stole from the Republicans was, let's put money in infrastructure. Let's repair our roads. Let's repair our schools. Let's repair our bridges. Very popular that was a Republican idea. idea. The minute that he brings it up, forget it. It's not right. happening. So there's a lot of room for bipartisanship. Small business was certainly something. Uh, that got bipartisan support. Bipartisan Hi, my name is, support. oh, sorry. Go ahead. My name is Will Pop Webster. I'm a senior at the college, uh, and I am a history major. So I'm wondering, uh, we brought in the historical perspective a little bit already, but do you think there's any particular lessons, either culturally or institutionally, we can learn from other periods in American history that have had this uh, significant partisanship that might uh, show the way forward, some way that has happened in the past to get through that, or some way that we've seen that end uh, that might suggest some uh, strategies for the future. Alex, do you have an example of, uh, we're still here, we still have a democracy, we had a lot of problems in the past, how do we get through it? Uh, you know, we've been very lucky, uh, <laughs> is, is, uh, is, is part of the answer. I mean, I, 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 think, I think the issue that we face is, you know, is will this deadlock, will this period of acrimony uh, be self-correcting, okay? Because that's, you know, I mean, in effect, that's what happened in the early 19th century. The Civil War is a whole, I mean, it's a little, it's a little, a little bizarre to talk about it as self-correcting. Um, but that's what happened yeah. in, the early, in, in, the, in the early 19th century. Um, the institutional configurations in the 30s with the courts took care of themselves. But, you know, the fact is, uh, if, in the 2014 and 2016 elections, things come out looking quite differently and this, and this deadlock resolves, this is gonna look like a little blip. But one of the questions is, can it be self-correcting or are there the kinds of mechanisms which Professor Scott Paul was talking about, uh, which are going to prevent the self-corrections uh, from occurring? And we, you know, we don't know the answer to that yet, but, uh, but I think that's, that's what we have to keep our eye on. I come from a profession that, whose models say that the self-correction should have already occurred. It's a profession wedded to the median voter model that says that when parties lose elections badly, they move quickly to the middle to recapture majority support. That mechanism has not operated. Now, I'm not saying it won't, but the extremist wing of the Republican Party has to be defeated three times in a row. I'm willing to go out on a limb and say three times in a row, including in a midterm election when often um, non-Republicans do not turn out in large numbers 
for uh, the forces in the Republican Party that would recapture their party and move it back to the middle to be able to take hold. We have seen things on the left like this where a repositioning had to occur. I don't think they ever went quite as far as we're seeing right now, but uh, we're in for a period of turbulence here, and I don't think this is over yet. Not over yet, and not over by when January 15th, when we uh, no. come back at it again. Good evening, my name is Autumn Lawrence, and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, so in the past five years, we haven't had a budget passed. There have only been continuing resolutions. Um, and if I had been in the lightning round, I would like to see a budget passed. So I was wondering if there were any suggestions that you all had for reforming the process. Well, I'll, I'll jump on that because that goes right to this whole idea of no budget, no pay. And as I said before, it was used as a short-term solution to a very specific issue that dealt with the debt ceiling. But our idea is to do exactly what you're asking, which is to say that uh, we pass a no budget, no pay piece of legislation that applies to all budget and appropriations that have a deadline that if they, and, and you're right, the consequences of having a continuing resolution just means literally that everything just keeps being shoved down the road. And, and, and I think the consequences of that are, are so deep and so damaging that that very thing, if we could just get budgets and real budgets and get them in on time, uh, we would start addressing these very real problems. So I think no budget, no pay is, would exist. You know, it's exactly a really popular right. idea. I love the idea myself, and I get who's us every time I mention it in the real world. But they're heavily millionaires. And particularly the ones who are voting to shut down the government are. They are not going to respond to just that. I mean, in, in a way, it's an insult to to the Tea Party forces to suggest that they're all in it for personal gain. I actually think they are, um, in their own way of thinking of things, principled. And um, their principles are wrong. <laughs> well, I, I just say it, it's, it, it's... But they're not corrupt. It's not a principle to not have a budget. And, uh, and just, just to put a point on it, you know how difficult it is, to, it beat, is. to beat a... a, a any incumbent, and we had a hearing in the Senate on no budget, no pay, and Joe Lieberman had a hearing. The Republican who was in charge of the House Committee at the time refused to hear it. He didn't like it, in sort of typical, but in arrogant Washington fashion. Not only did he not like it, he wouldn't let anybody even talk about it. He wouldn't hold a hearing. And we said, listen, have a hearing. Say how much you hate it, that's fine, but just have a public hearing. He refused to do that. On that issue alone, or mostly on that issue, uh, a congressman named Ami Barra from California ran against that incumbent congressman and beat him. So, and that's a very much a grassroots issue, and it is a real issue, and I don't care if you're a millionaire or not, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with your obligation and responsibility to pass a budget. Hi, everyone. My name is Adam Hotchkiss, and I'm a junior at Harvard College and also a student liaison for Karen Mills. Thank you all for being here. Um, so President Obama has come out and said that um, you know, the rich need, need to do their fair share, and for those who are a little less well off, he has created lab ladders of opportunity and, and tried to push those kinds of policies. Um, and when Congress has done things like go against him with, with gun control, he has put in place a few executive actions as like a symbolic gesture against Republican opposition. So my question for the panel um, is to what extent do you think the opposition is a symbolic opposition to this president versus a structural opposition to his policy initiatives? a question that we grappled with intensely in our field work uh, with Tea Party people. Because uh, here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, there are a lot of people who think Barack Obama is kind of a softie. But in Tea Party land, especially at the grassroots, he's seen as a foreign presence uh, taking America away from a real Americans. And what we heard in people's voices was intense fear of that. So I think there is, and there's another book on the Tea Party done by a scholar out at the University of Washington, Seattle, where that's used the kinds of measures that social psychologists use to get at intensity of ethnic stereotyping and racial stereotyping. 
and they've found that even compared to other conservatives and other Republicans, Tea Party grassroots people, and remember this is about half of the voters and the good citizen half that are pressing on many of these Republican legislators. Um, they do hold more severe negative stereotypes. Um, now, I don't think it helps to slap a label on active citizens, and these are our, our good citizens. But there is something about Obama that has set off a level of fear and counter-mobilization, so that when he is no longer president, there may be a bit less of an edge. But let's not kid ourselves. I mean, William Jefferson Clinton is a good old boy from Arkansas and he was fiercely opposed uh, on a lot of the same grounds uh, that President Obama has been opposed. And if the next president happens to be Hillary Rodham Clinton, she too will be fiercely opposed uh, by a lot of the same forces. And, and you know, if I could just say something, I re recall when we were uh, at the State of the Union address and there was a, a member of the House that called the president a liar. Um, I think that's the big difference shocking. now when you can insult you can insult the president and his you know his his title and I think that that to me turns a lot of people off and I would hope that people if you get turned off then put it into action and mobilize because it's disrespectful it's also disrespectful of his cabinet members because I know uh, Karen and I have talked about this we go into hearings and the, I mean it was amazing the treatment that we would receive uh, just uh, no, to me, people that are just not very respectful. There was no decorum, no etiquette. The, all the rules were out the door, and you were the person to get. And if I could, if I could bring you down, I'm going to do everything I can. And that went for some of the cabinet members. And I remember having to face committees that were not friendly and and were just diametrically opposed to anything that I was implementing. Green jobs was one of them. There was a big discussion about there are no green jobs. So that whole discussion kind of took its own life and it was very disturbing. Um, but on the other hand, it also lit a, lit a fuel amongst progressives and people that thought, wait a minute, we know this is what needs to happen. And people did get mobilized and thank goodness that people got activated, but we need to have more of that. Well, middle of the road Americans were also not on board with this kind of disrespect at all. Not at all, so it's not been popular. Uh, it's a really good question. You know, is, is, is it institutional or is it the policies? I'd say it, it's, it's largely institutional. There's lots of examples, like immigration was a good one where Republicans should be voting for this. But, but you know, I, I, I remember all those years of all the Democratic Bush love. I mean, I was, you know, uh, so, uh, so there's equal disparaging of, of Republicans and Democrats. And uh, the, uh, I, I, I thought it'd be, it'd be an interesting exercise for somebody to write a, a to go back and look at the speeches of George Bush in 1999 and Barack Obama in 2007. Uh, uh, and, and compare, if you, and I think if you mixed them up and you grabbed one, you wouldn't be sure who, who was who. Because they were saying the exact same thing, particularly about changing the tone in Washington, bringing people together, exact same thing. And, uh, and then they both met uh, the sort of partisan tsunami uh, in, same and in similar and different ways, but the ultimate effect was the same. I mean, Bush had the sort of, you're not a legitimate president because of the Supreme Court, Obama had the birther stuff, sort of different things, but at the end of the day, it was like Democrats were saying Bush is not legitimate, Republicans saying Obama's not legitimate. So I think you're right, it's an institutional kind of reflex, which is really uh, a bad and, and, and hopeful and, and not, not, not fair and not right. Uh, it is what it is, and you know, hopefully, uh, you know, it's, I think it's in part a sign of our times, it's in, in part because of who they were, but maybe new leadership uh, will be able to uh, leach some of that poison out of the No world. Democrat mm -hmm. stood up and called George Bush. Oh, I don't agree. I, oh, 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 you, oh, I'll, I'll, uh, in, of in course the middle of a state of a union. No, I know, I know. I'm just, no, and it really does matter. And, I'm the one I, that stood up and gave Joe Wilson money, at, I, I mean, uh, his opponent when that happened, okay? So, uh, yes, I get that. No, but, but my point is. There's also a clear difference. There certainly are crazy extremists on both ends of the spectrum. Right, that's uh, the only point I'm trying to make. But there's a big difference when public leadership figures in the political party and office holders 
both echo and encourage the craziest elements. I agree. And the, while that may have happened in the Democratic Party back in the 80s, it did not happen under George W. Bush. So there's a difference. So we have time for a last question. Uh, my name is Ben Bolger, and I'm an alum of Harvard. Um, some people have talked about the importance of campaign uh, finance reform. Others have talked about the need to improve civic education in grade school, in high school, to encourage more voting behavior. I'm wondering um, if the panel has any thoughts or can be have any reasons to be optimistic about in encouraging more voter turnout, especially in the primaries, which seem to be increasingly radicalized of recent. Is there any hope for more broad mainstream voters to be engaged in the process of picking candidates, which are very important? I think one positive development on that front is what we call the jungle primary, which uh, they do in Louisiana, and I think they're starting to do in California, uh, where, y where it's really not a, where, where you have a primary, but the primary is not within the parties. It's just a general primary where the top two vote getters then run off. So you could have, so Republicans, everybody runs together, and you could have two Democrats run off against each other or two Republicans run off against each other. I think that's maybe part of the, the solution. I don't know about that. <laughs> we had a terrible race in California where two uh, members that had pretty much I identical backgrounds in terms of their philosophies, two Democrats, spent like $7 million. And boy, oh boy, let me tell you, a lot of people were really upset about that. You know, I, mean, I don't think, uh, oh, go ahead. I just, I just wanted to come in on, on, the, on the question of turnout, because um, it relates to other issues that we spoke about. Uh, Turnout is in, in American elections, less so in primaries, but in general, is quite good in the middle class and the upper middle class. It's among poor people in the working class that turnout is very low. There's, you know, many political scientists and historians have made their living trying to, trying to in, interpret that. But it's, there certainly seems to be a lot of evidence. A part of it uh, is, the, is that working class people and poor people don't see that there's much in it for them either way. And frankly, I don't think you're going to get an increase in turnout until that changes and until they really do see that it will really matter to them. Now, one fringe benefit, I think, of what the Republican Party has been doing is that it's actually been making the case that it might, that there is a difference between the parties. Uh, 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 and, and maybe that will boost some of this. Turnout. And it has already. I mean, minority and youth turnout has gone up in the last two presidential elections. And it, for example, in the Virginia election that just occurred, um, turnout was low, as it often is in these, this is kind of off, off year in Virginia, because they don't even, it's not even, but black turnout was high. And it's probably related to the fact that the black community is, is uh, supportive of Obama, but also because there's a perception in many minority communities that efforts are being made to discourage their vote. And uh, we saw those long, long lines in the last election of people, even 90-year-old minority women standing in long lines to make sure that their vote wasn't taken away from them. So the, there is a counter-reaction, and, and, and that's part of it. Now, I have to say, I don't think procedural fixes, I am a historical social scientist, and I'll tell you that there's been one reform movement after another in this country that has thought that had some procedural fixes, you know, change the way something, referendum or election, or have no labels, or have independence, and it always <laughs> backfires. You might need the last word. <laughs> and in the state of Maine, where I spend a lot of time, I love the state of Maine, but you know, in, they ended up with a Tea Party <laughs> governor who says crazy things, and who the state doesn't, fit the state's style and is deeply unpopular. And how did that happen? It happened because independents run in Maine and there, he got, the crazy Republican governor got elected with 37% of the vote. So one has to be very careful when trying to build up these alternatives in the middle. The American institutional system does not make it easy for Last. a separate party to make headway. Last word, Mike. Uh, well, that's for sure, and, and I, I, I was familiar <laughs> with the Americans Elect experiment last time. Um, yeah. But um, the, uh, I mean, I, I think I would agree with your point, which is, you know, these process fixes aren't going to be, 
except around the edges, aren't going to dial up or down voter turnout uh, in any significant way. But I would say that on the issue that we kind of touched on here toward the end, which is econ uh, economic despair, income uh, disparity, that that to me is something that is a is a huge problem, a growing problem, uh, one in which you know you really are pitting sort of classes against each other, and that's where you could get a real kind of revolution from the streets mm -hmm. and something that, I mean, it's going to be that sort of thing that creates a huge dynamic shift in turnout. I think when people are really saying, I'm getting screwed and we're rising up. So. On that note, uh, please <laughs> join me Don't think in that's thanking um, the President, President Faust, for convening us here and this fabulous panel. Thank you so much for being here. And good questions. Good questions. From, Excellent um, questions. Well, Thank you all. Very good. Nicely done. Yeah. Well, it was interesting that we ended up.